Okay, Chris is going to, Bayer takes on the character of Major William Ormsby to tell the story of how the struggle over the Central Overland Wagon Road uh, uh, degenerated into bloody conflict between two local factions. His book, he has two books, his topic tonight <coughs> is Prophets, Plots, and Lynching. He has two, uh, another book upstairs in the bookstore, correct? The Miner's Farewell, and he also has written two other books, haven't you? Or, yeah, so these are on sale upstairs in our Main Street bookstore. The, the museum will be open upstairs for you to look at if you haven't already. Enjoy. It's nice of you all to come out this evening in the wind. The wind uh, blows the air off of the mountains, blows the rain out of uh, the west, and some of the things blows stick to the ground, like the snow. <laughs> I'm sure on your minds tonight, as on mine, are the other things that blows out of the west, yeah, improvers. <laughs> from the state that must not be named. <laughs> but I'm hoping that you will think about that tonight because tonight's story is one of the great improvers. And in order to summon the major, I think we all need to go ahead. I mean, we need to, we need to say that phrase Go ahead. This is the 1850s we're going back to, and this is how you would say it in the 1850s. Are we ready one more time? Go ahead. I, I feel his presence. <laughs> yes, he's, he's on his way. <laughs> Citizens, my name is, is William Ormsby. Uh, my friends call me Major. <laughs> I, I came west in 1849 from, from Pennsylvania. I packed Overland. My, my wife, uh, one, of the, one of the Kentucky trombos, had a, we had a young child, Lizzie, and she was just a few years old. And, and great fortune lay in California. So I packed Overland with mules and my brother John. We arrived in Sacramento. And there we saw great progress, great, great ideas, great go-ahead plans. You see, the miners in California had lots of gold dust, but, but no mint, no way of turning their gold dust into coin, just crude ingots, but no real coin. And so we hired a dentist and created a mint. Uh, we didn't know how to melt the gold, but the dentists knew how to melt the gold, and we created gold coins. Uh, these go-ahead plans didn't work out. <laughs> but there, there were great plans in the West. I, I thought I, I would run, I, I, would, I would go into business with my wife's brother, John, John Trumbo, of, of, that I mentioned, the Kentucky Trumbos. <laughs> and we would open a horse market. Now, most immigrants come West with with mules and oxen pulling their wagons. And so there were very few horses in California. A man who rode a horse in California was, well, shall we say, much higher up than anyone else. And horses were in great demand. So a horse market was catering to the elite. We didn't have very many horses, however. So I went back to Pennsylvania. I, I brought uh, Lizzie and my wife, uh, Margaret with me in, in 51, 52, and we came west again. We, we hooked the horses up to carriages. Fortunately, no, they all died. <laughs> that that go-ahead plan didn't work out. <laughs> when we reached Salt Lake City, we, we decided to accelerate our, our trip, and we took the Hastings Cutoff, which, you remember the Donner Party, that didn't work out very well. But when I got back to Sacramento, I, I, I thought, I want to be part of the great the great roadway going across the nation, and there were plans to, to build a central overland road. And I 
began to run the stage up to Marysville in 53. Because from Marysville, this, the, the road was predicted to go west over, over the desert, or east over the desert. <laughs> that wasn't happening right away. Although many men in, in California were, were writing to, to Washington and saying, fund a mint, fund, fund an overland road, fund a railroad. Congress was slow to act and, and help the West. I, nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I resolved to join in with, with William Walker. It was plainly Yankee ingenuity that could bring to people in the world who did not know how to exploit their economic resources properly. It was Yankee ingenuity that came to California in the 1840s and, and showed California how to efficiently harbor its resources and turn its inefficient Spanish land grant system into a uh, productive enterprise. And Nicaragua needed the same thing. And so William Walker and, and, and many of us we, we went to Nicaragua to deliver them the benefits of, of Yankee ingenuity. And they welcomed us at first, but then they changed their mind. And, and, and by, by the fall of 1856, uh, many of us were leaving Nicaragua. William Walker's enterprise there was apparently a failure. And returning to California. But by now, I truly knew where my destiny lay. I truly knew the issue to which, to which I should attach my fortune. I truly knew what was at stake in the Central Overland Road. From 1850 on, far-seeing men, go-ahead men with go-ahead plans, knew that it was the Central Overland Road by which sufficient emigrants would arrive in California with the drought of 54 and 55, emigration was down. And that flow of cash that the immigrants brought was down. But there was a much greater issue. With sufficient immigrants in the far west, California would be safe from potential incursion by the British or the French or the Russians or others who were also in the gold fields of California. The American population would swell, but even more important, there would be enough population in California that it could save the states in the East. And you know what was happening in the states in the East. Yes, California was sufficient population. People could exercise their democratic rights. And California would split into a northern half and to a southern half. And as in the East, the northern half would, would be abolitionist, and the southern half would hold slaves. It took sufficient population to do this. Not only would this ensure the, the, the standing of California, as, as, but it would, it would save the nation. If, if only the principle of self-determination could be replicated in the West, the nation could be spared the looming civil conflict that we all saw by 56. Kansas was already in flames. If only we could bring enough emigrants to the far west. And as a contingency, we thought if not many states split out of California, then perhaps a Pacific Republic could be created in the far west, a new nation. Once again, replicating the balance in the east and showing how it could be done. My friend, Judge Crane from Virginia wrote a book on this in 1856 called The Past, Present, and Future of the Pacific. And, and he, after, after years, seven years of, of effort in this direction, he had grown somewhat weary of Washington's inaction and California's lack of progress. And he knew that perhaps an inland empire was where this dream could be realized. An empire along the eastern slope. In the, along the eastern slope here in, in the Great Basin lay Utah Territory. John Reese had arrived along with many others in 51. And ostensibly this was to be the province of, 
of Utah Territory under polygamous Mormon control. But the Mormons had not sufficiently exercised that control. They had sent colonists, they had sent a judge, and they had, they had by 57, by late 56, we knew they were leaving, they were going home, and that they were leaving once again this area in a political vacuum. Over the years, the residents here in this valley, here, which was the center of all activity, had petitioned California for annexation, had petitioned Congress for a new territory, had talked about a new territory, Isaac Roof up in Honey Lake. In 56, they declared a new territory called Natakwa to fill this void. Over and over, these efforts had happened here from 1851 to 1856, and none with six great success. But with the colonists, the Mormon colonists set to leave, and with the pending conflict in the East, and with men like James Crane and myself losing all patience with Washington, it was time to act. Go ahead. It was time for go-ahead plans. So I joined up with Jared Crandall's stage line. Jared Crandall, who ran the Pioneer stage out of Placerville. Mud wagons, not the, not the coaches with the sides, but the slim mud wagons that could make it over the, over the mountain. <coughs> in June of 57, Jared Crandall arrived here in Genoa. It was a great, with great fanfare and publicity in the press. He drove it on the, on the trail. There was no road, it was the trail. And he showed that the wagon, even on the trail, could make it from Placerville. A stage line not running <coughs> from east to west, funded by Congress. But we would show Congress. We would run the stage line from the west to the east, and we would start it. And so I arrived in the summer of 57, and set up as Jared Crandall's stage agent in Genoa. I rented the old Mormon station, the corral, with a little house next to it. And I saw immediately, as I knew, the need for law and order, for, for government, for organization here. And I rang my bell. <laughs> Citizens, I cried. We need to have a meeting. We need to get together. We need to petition Congress. We need to join. We, we, down from Honey Lake came, came the Never Sweats. Men from all over gathered. And we drew up a petition to Congress and we told them, there is mineral worth here. Mineral worth far beyond your greatest imagining. We can't tell you the details. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but people here knew John Reese had arrived in 51 for the purpose of taking the gold from Gold Canyon and sending it back to his brother Enoch in Salt Lake City who ran the mint there. And the Grosch brothers by the mid-1850s were already trying to figure out how do you get that silver out of that gray rock? They resolved, after leaving California, to never mine gold again. It was all around them. No, no. California had been too frustrating. We knew. And we sent James Crane with this petition back to Washington to talk to his friend, the head of the Committee on Territories, William Smith from Virginia, that he knew. The very day, though, the very day that we held the meeting in Genoa. Desperados. Desperados and renegades rode in off the Great Basin into the trucking meadows and, <coughs> and stole all of the supplies that I had provisioned there, ready to build the next stage station. For the stage would come from Placerville to Genoa, to my, my stage station, it would go to the Truckee Meadows, and then it would go north to Honey Lake, and then it would take the wagon road that was expected to cross from there to the east. I rode out to the Humboldt Sink, and I asked the traders, I said, what is going on? What? Desperados had ridden, they said, Desperados and Renegades, an organized band of them, regularly commits depredations on the Emigrant Trail. 
Of course, the stories of this have been common in California <coughs> as immigrants arrived in off the trail through the, through the here on the Carson route, and then later as the Truckee route became more popular, the, the stories of these raids were, were legion. But an organized band, I looked around. Who here could be running in charge of this organized band in polygamist Utah? <laughs> Lucky Bill. <laughs> the rogue. The gambler. The man who cheated honest miners out of $24,000 in 1851 arrived here, loaned the money to John Reese. John Reese took the money. He bought cattle. He fixed the bridges in, in, the, in the canyon. <coughs> and then his friend Bernard, who had, who had the cattle in Eagle Valley, took off in 54 with all the cattle. John Reese went bankrupt and turned over the toll road in the emigrant camp, in the, on the emigrant trail through the canyon to Lucky Bill. Turned over the entire contents of his warehouse to Lucky Bill. <coughs> Turned over all of Eagle Valley to Lucky Bill. This was what prompted Reese to go in, in 54 back to, to bring him young and say, I've, I've decided to be a Mormon again. <laughs> Send help. And, and, and Young had sent Orson Hyde out to restore the fortunes of the Reese Company. Um, Ill-considered plan that didn't work. But Lucky Bill, the wealthiest, well, people liked him. He could tell stories. He could, he could rig thimbles. He, was, he had two wives, one in town, one at the ranch. <laughs> he drank, he swore. And he had newspaper articles written about him, touting him as a <clears throat> polygamous Mormon. Obviously. Now, what else was going on here? Horse thieves. Horse thieves. The emigrants would arrive here. They would, they would have made their journey. When they reached Ragtown and came along, the, they had they really They'd really come through all of the hard, hard territory when they reached the Carson River, but they really had made it when they reached the pastures of Carson Valley. This was, this was truly arriving after, after uh, up to three months of difficult, difficult journey. They would take that, that toll road up the canyon, and they would arrive at Hope Valley, and they would camp there. And at night, the border ruffians would ride down and relieve them of excess oxen and mules, take them up to Horse, the Horse Thief Canyon to Horse Thief Meadow, and as they walked to Placerville, drove them down into the valley, fattened them up and drove them back to uh, Fort Hall and Salt Lake City, four other immigrants to use. These were Lucky Bill's next door neighbors doing this. I could see what was going on. And, and others could too. And others, others urged me. They said, we need, we need to do something. I said, we must be patient. We must not act too hastily. I'm, I'm just a teamster. Just a man with a go-ahead plan. And so in the winter of 57 and 58, we jockeyed for position. Now, we had proposed Sierra Nevada Territory because Isaac Roop and all of the Honey Lakers wanted to be on this side of the border. You see, if they were on that side of the border, they would be paying California taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and they intended to subdivide. <laughs> that, was a, that, was, would be a, uh, that would be a um, discouragement to uh, people buying their subdivisions. <clears throat> so they were, they were very much in favor of the Sierra Nevada Territory type, which would make the border, we hoped, the crest of the mountains leaving Honey Lake in the new territory. They were <coughs> friends. Lucky Bill had lots of, did I tell you he was a good storyteller? Mm -hmm. He had lots of friends right here. 
And he and his friends, principally Uncle Billy and Richard Allen, the undercover reporter for the, for the San Francisco <coughs> uh, they proposed a different territory. They wanted to call it Carson Territory and put the capital just north of Genoa, the foot of Sierra Creek, in a town called Harford. And they began to take up all this land and, and get their friends to buy up land as the colonists were leaving to, to really create an occupancy of the, of the valley here. So we had two competing ideas about how this territory would look. Fortunately, in the spring of 58, my friends in Honey Lake discovered that Lucky Bill had, had uh, stolen some cattle and, and uh, murdered a man. This was very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, they, they, they rode down in secret in June of 58. They rode down in secret in a posse, and I waited up all night in Genoa. And when they arrived early in the morning, I showed them where to, buy, to find Lucky Bill's house. And they came upon him early in the morning. They woke him up. They put him in shackles. They took him to the north end of the valley. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, they built a scaffold. And then they held a trial. <laughs> Bill, Bill had a lot of Lucky Bill had a lot of friends, and and it was at this point after we had disposed of Lucky Bill that my, I could not restrain my supporters, and they declared themselves. Well, let, let me ask it this way, gentlemen. We have members of the fair sex here tonight. We have ladies that we, we know we have children home. We have the desire to build churches and schools, safe roads, to have government and law and order in a lawless region. A lawless region that, as we told Congress, lies 700 miles from the, the authority that claims it in Salt Lake and over a snow-ridden mountain range to California that cannot take any, any problems here. Gentlemen, how many of you, I'd like to see a show of hands now, would, would stand with me to help bring the benefits of civilization to this lawless region? Please, I'd like to see a show of hands for, for the gentlemen that are they're brave. They'll stand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. <laughs> the People's Committee declared itself upon the hanging of Lucky Bill. I, unfortunately, was not very popular in Genoa at this point. And my friend James Crane had written me in April. He'd said, Congress may or may not act, but you need to have a capital. You need to build a capital for your new territory. Genoa you know, it didn't look like a likely place at this point. And so I went over to Downeyville and found my friends, uh, Musser and Proctor. And uh, Musser, a uh, district attorney in Downeyville, was a, a fairly important man with the uh, American Party. American Party, people who believe that those Catholics should not come into this country. <laughs> this, this country was not founded by Catholics. <laughs> Taking our jobs. <laughs> and so Musser, and, and, and they came over and they, they bought the Mankin Ranch a month or so after uh, we disposed of Lucky Bill. And we began to lay out uh, a capital for uh, the new territory. Of course, we didn't have a new territory really yet. We were still hoping that, that Congress would act. Now, that was the summer of 58. It was a busy summer. <laughs> Went into the winter, and, and along, along comes the spring of 1859. And I hear from James Crane, and he says, Congress just cannot manage to see our vision, our go-ahead plan. We have a plan to save the nation. We have a plan to save the states, to, pre to preserve. But it's our friends, some of whom are in the South, 
and some of whom are in the North, who have, Congress has ground into complete stalemate. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Nothing is getting done. <laughs> and so, in June of 59, early 59, James Crane arrives back here and, and joins me as we're, we're, we're building, we're building, we're about to build the new city in Carson. We really haven't done much construction yet. We're going to call it Carson City. Uh, Lucky Bill doesn't get that to use that name anymore. It's our name. <laughs> and I'm going to build a, a new hotel for the for the, the for, yeah, but we need a government. And if Congress, well, let's let's back up. Three days after James Crane arrives back from Washington, we announce the discovery of the Ofer. What becomes called later in the summer the Comstock mind. Um, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and then we plan for oh, another meeting. <laughs> Citizens, we gather again in Genoa, all of us together, well, half of us, because at this point, not only have we not really welcome in Genoa, but the people in Genoa have petitioned Salt Lake City for the reinstallation of Utah's government here. So Genoa is in Utah, Carson City is, well, we need a new territory, but we come to Genoa in the hope that they'll join with us. And we have supporters here too. So we have a big meeting and we declare Nevada territory. Congress had shortened it from Sierra Nevada to they thought Sierra Nevada was too long. Shortened it to Nevada Territory. You know, let Congress get around to joining us when they will. <laughs> We're going to go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> and we declare it. Uh, somebody suggests we have a vote. So we have a vote. Um, fortunately, there's, there's immigrants on the trail provide a few extra votes, but we get, we, get, we get the votes we need, and we create about it. We elect Isaac Root, my friends, the Never Sweats in Honey Lake, we elect Isaac Root uh, as uh, our first territorial governor, and things are looking good. Now it's, it's September, uh, uh, Henry Comstock is sent over to uh, San Francisco with a wagon full of ore. Because what you need to do when you're a prospector, I don't know how many prospectors we have here tonight, uh, prospectors don't work. Prospectors wait for financiers to show up. <laughs> and we wanted to show them the value, and they didn't believe the local assays we'd done. They, they, they didn't believe. So a wagon was sent over to San Francisco where there were uh, English investors and wealthy Eastern investors and men with great money. A wagon, Henry Comstock took the wagon over there. They saw this, and it didn't take them very long to get back here. Not very long at all. In fact, it was a matter of days, and they were here in September. Uh, Henry Comstock was sleeping off his wages in Carson City, and uh, we laid out in Virginia City. I had, I had a lot of go-ahead plans. You see, I also had another um, site planned for a city uh, at the... Uh, Southern approach over here, uh, where Johntown is, where uh, later Dayton was, uh, Mineral Springs had a city plant there uh, at, on the Carson River, at, the, at that approach to the Comstock. And then we had another city plan at Steamboat. And then, of course, there was Carson City, and now we laid out Virginia City. My friend James Crane from Virginia <coughs> was up there shortly, about three days later. And uh, he was dining at Golden Hill. And uh, he just proposed to the miners that we tax them. <laughs> Fortunately, he fell over dead. <laughs> While we had dinner in Gold Hill. <laughs> this wasn't good. Some of our go-ahead plans didn't work. I don't know what to do. I, I, I suggested a provisional government for Carson City, and the, and the miners voted it down. Now, now all of a sudden there were tens of thousands, tens of thousands of 
young men, it seemed, everywhere on the hills. Everywhere people were looking for gold. Nobody knew where gold was. Gold, everywhere they were looking. Gold, digging everywhere, camped out. And then winter. The worst winter. 25 feet of snow on the mountain pass. Four feet of snow on the valley floors. Young men with their bundles, called them bummers, everywhere, eating rabbits, digging through the snow for the wild onion, half starved. Nobody wanted to talk about government. Desperate, desperate winter. The stage had gone, had run briefly. 58, the summer, we had the stage actually running. Federal government had it funded that the stagecoaches were all broken down, but we had the stage going and now nothing was running. No, no one was going anywhere. As the, as the snows thawed in the spring of 1860, <coughs> terrible news arrived from the Carson River. Things were in chaos and now, and now this. The massacre of the Williams Brothers. I'm dead now, so I can tell you what really happened. But I didn't know this at the time. It seems that the, the Williams brothers had, um, had kidnapped a young Paiute girl uh, and ravished her. And the Paiutes had heard about this. Uh, uh, the girl's father had ridden into Williams Station on the big bend of the Carson River and uh, had killed the Williams brothers. I didn't know that, but I, I did hear that there had been this, this killing. Now, the Paiutes were my friends. I had inherited from, from Isaac Roop the peace treaty that, that had been made in 56 with the Paiutes. I had taken, in 57, I had taken young Sarah Winnemunca into my house because Chief Winnemunca and I, we agreed that there needed to be peace. In fact, he was looking at the farmland in California to relocate the tribe because it was obvious to us that with that there was no way that we could control white settlement. It was going to happen. It was, no one was making these decisions that this should take place. It was simply happening. And it was going to change their lives, whether we wanted it to or not. And so their issue was survival. So they needed, they needed to learn to communicate with us, and we needed to learn to... So we brought Sarah Winnemucca into my house. For two years she lived and played with, with, with Lizzie. She called me her best good friend. I was like her second father. I knew many of her relatives in the Paiute Nation. I inherited the peace treaty. I was not one of those, of those whites who said, just shoot them all. But now, the stage line had, had failed. There was chaos. Governmental efforts were in question. Law and order needed to be preserved. And so, outside of the Ormsby House in Carson City, by the Liberty Bell, there at the corner of 2nd and Carson, I rang my bell. <laughs> citizens, citizens, I ask you, who will go with me and restore order to our, our fledgling territory? Thirty men responded to the call in Carson City, another twelve from Genoa, and another seventy-five from Virginia City. And we met out there at the Williams Station. One of the Williams brothers was still, had a few moments of life left in him, and, he's, and he told us uh, that the Paiutes had done this. And we could see the tracks leading, leading north to Pyramid Lake. And so we rode north, we camped in the light snow, that night. And I, I begged the men, I said, I said, make me your overall leader. We need, a, we, need, we, need to have, we need to have authority here. We need to act responsibly. But of course, some men were, were out for an Indian for breakfast. The next day, at about four in the afternoon, we arrived at Pyramid Lake. The Paiutes seemed to have known we were coming. We were a, a force of about 100. And as we were below us, a, a small ridge, a sandy ridge, we could see a uh, hundred or so of them arrayed uh, just above us, uh, several feet, 
on their horses. We were mostly uh, riding mules and carrying shotguns and Navy Colt revolvers. They were riding horses. Uh, they, they, were, they were enamored of the Plains Indian and had, had sort of adopted this, and they had the long rifles. Well, we thought we saw what might be a peace pipe or, or something in, in the hands of one of them. So one of the men took his, his scope, he had a scope on, an, on a rifle, and he looked at it and he said, no, it's a battle axe, a sign of war. Well, I turned to those from Virginia City and I said, I will ride up with my group of 30. And so we ascended the, the Sandy Ridge on our mules. Now, the Texas Rangers have a tactic, of course, that when you are carrying a revolver against a group of uh, a force armed with rifles on it, you, you want to get in very close, very fast, because they're carrying rifles and they have one shot and it's not easy to aim up close. So we rode as hard as we could to get in close and to show them that we were here to preserve the, the rule of law. Firing began. The, the mules were not army mules and the sand was treacherous. Men began to fall off the mules. And we were not in close. The men panicked and, 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 and began to turn. And so we, we turned to rejoin the main group. We came back to the main group. And the main group turned to get the shelter of the trees. And as we turned, 300 more Paiutes came up from behind us. And they encircled us. The men lost all semblance of order. Men were screaming. Men dove into the river. Men threw their guns away. And that afternoon along the Truckee River, over the next hour and a half, in a long line, in a long retreat, some 80 were picked off one by one. When the, when, the, when the saddle turned on my mule, I turned, I had an arrow in my, in my side and another in my face, and I, I turned to, to those following me, to the Paiutes, and I held out my powder as a sign of peace. And my friend, Numaga, he, he, he rode up and he said, Mayor, uh, Major, lie down. I'll shoot over your head. I don't think you're dead. I didn't know what he was saying, and it was too late. They stripped my body and Threw it, over the, threw it over the side into the river. When news from a few stragglers arrived back in Carson City of, of my demise and of so many others, it was the greatest defeat of an armed white force since, by, by the native, since um, the French Indian War. And the Telegraph recently arrived in Carson City, sent news back to California, where militias were drawn up, and, and, and the California militia decided to cross the border, and they crossed and engaged in another brief battle with, with the Pikes. But my go-ahead plans, we were here to talk about my go-ahead plans, weren't we? <coughs> when Lincoln was elected, the Southern Senators began to withdraw they knew his reputation, and the South began to withdraw its senators from Congress, leaving behind enough to take action. And on the last day of President Buchanan's administration, two things were enacted side by side. The funding of the Central Overland Wagon Road, getting rid of the, the Pony Express, which is a temporary expedient. The funding of the, ten, of the Central Wagon Road and the stage line and the creation of Nevada territory, side by side. Well, enough for Armsby. What do you think? <laughs> Um, 
They used to say that uh, this, was a, this area was a haven for Hersties from California and renegade Mormons from Utah. <laughs> um, I, and I don't make this stuff up, and I'm not trying to be facetious. This is just what was said. Uh, this, this area, what Ormsby probably did better than anyone, and people had been trying to do this for 10 years before he, he finally succeeded, at least in getting some motion and action on it. Everyone that was here recognized where this place is geographically. Where is it? Every time the road closes to California, I, I hope it crosses your mind. It's like, where are we? <laughs> We're a long way from someplace. This is, this, is a, this is a place that can be suddenly a long way from some place, from any place else. And imagine in 1850s how far this was from the east or from California. And what's here? Lumber, gold, can't eat it. You know, snow. <laughs> so this, this was a, his experience, for instance, coming uh, with the disastrous, the disastrous experience, bringing horses and carriages. Oh my gosh, what was he thinking in '52? Uh, he wanted horses for the horse market, no doubt, but carriages? I mean, you know, oh, oh yeah, and we'll just have bolts and carriages too. Um, horses couldn't make that trip, and uh, that's and, and, and hopefully he learned that lesson. And this is part of why he was. Petitioning and, and in the petition to Congress was, was emphasizing, we are a long way away. You've got to help us. You've got to do something to create order here. When Nevada State was created, how much of it did the federal government take? Well, most of it because who, who could rule it? And what was the history from 1849 to 1864 when Nevada State was created? What was the history of law and order in the Great Basin. It was a history of renegade depredations. And there's a, in, in my fabulous book, did I mention my fabulous book? <laughs> in my fabulous book, Profit, Plots, and Lynching, which you, you, you must all buy, um, there's, there's, of course, detailed discussion of more stories. Around, and I could go on and on and on tonight with stories. Uh, the story of torrential juice, uh, the story of murder, Peter Lassen, uh, the potato war, um, all of the different incidences uh, would be comic if, they, if, if these people weren't quite so um, desperate. But in in what was I talking about? The uh, I don't know. Any questions? <laughs> so. Um, 1864. The depredations on the on the emigrant trail appear to have come from a couple sources. One was that the the Salt Lake City administration um, disenfranchised the tribal structure in that part of, of Utah with handouts. Uh, the tribal structure was fairly intact here. This this tribe uh, in Pyramid Lake was fairly coherent, but farther to the east. Handouts had decimated the, the coherency of the tribal structure. And so now you had uh, individuals who, were, who, 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 if those handouts were cut off, would have no other livelihood and actually appear to have then allied with a significant group of whites. Um, it isn't real clear that these depredations were Native American-led or even predominantly Native American. These repetitions on the, on the immigrant trains uh, may have been more of what happened here. Recycling of stock. <laughs> only, only much, less, much less kind, because if you were out on the, on the immigrant trail, and you, what would happen is you would you'd put your, your, your team to sleep, you'd be sleeping beside your wagon, and you'd wake up in the morning and your stock would be gone. That was the most common practice. The stock simply disappeared. Uh, somebody could shout in the middle of the darkness, and you could hear them running off. But uh, you, immigrants weren't in a great position to ride endlessly looking for them, whereas, you, whereas the desperados and renegades out, out on them. And they seem to have actually been in a coherent group uh, centered up in the northern part of the Great Basin and, and, and coming down as far as uh, uh, particularly the Truckee Route and, and even the Carson Route.
but uh, it, that was actually happening. Was Lucky Bill in charge of all that? And that seems a little far-fetched. There was no real reason for him over here in Genoa to be in charge of all that. Aware of all that, mm, probably everybody in this valley knew who lived here knew some of that going on, and others participating some of some more than others. Uh, Lucky Bill was actually building a hotel called the White House in Genoa. Uh, he was he was really seeing himself as a great businessman, and as is explained in my book, his rogue image was something that at one point he appears to have marketed himself in order to upset the probate judge, Orson Hyde, when he was sent here from Salt Lake City. Orson Hyde was a very pious, true, you know, Christian, Mormon, you know, he was, he was the real thing. A lot of the early Mormon settlers here were not so interested in being part of Salt Lake City. But Orson Hyde was. Orson Hyde was a was, was sincere man. He couldn't stand this valley. At one point, he just, he just had had enough and he went up to Franktown to, to actually create a new territory. He was the one that, in 56, traveled up and down the eastern slope saying, we need a new territory. And by that, he probably meant another Mormon territory. He, there was, he was talking about that. Probably called Columbia. Uh, Genoa, Columbus's birthplace, Columbia for Columbia. And, um, and, and he had this vision of this, but it, he really kind of wore out, and, and I think Lucky Bill s saw him as a vulnerable person, and actually, he actually did a newspaper article in 55 that just said all the kinds of things that would drive Orson high bananas, uh, with, with, with the description of himself. Uh, two wives, drinking, gambling, I mean, just, just uh, the quintessential California gambling rogue. Lucky Bill, if you know the story, which is Lots and lots and lots of Lucky Bill in here, if you're interested. <laughs> Lucky Bill is also another two-hour discussion, but Lucky Bill uh, had, in fact, become the wealthiest man here. He had, Reese went bankrupt. Lucky Bill owned, seemed to own all the major assets. Imagine having a toll road on the Emigrant Trail in the Gold Rush. That sounds good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, at one point, the settlers here actually went to Lucky Bill and said, you know, it's time for you to, to let go of it. They petitioned him and they said, uh, when it was actually as Orson Hyde was arriving, they said it's time to, to, to let go of that. Uh, and one of the things that they, reasons that they probably were doing this is because Orson Hyde seems to be, have been coming here to take it over. And so if they could get him to open the toll gates and, you know, no more tolls before his arrival, that would take that possibility away. And there isn't much reference to Orson Hyde ever getting very far with doing anything with the toll road. It seems to have been defunct by the time he arrived. No more tolls. Uh, he, did, uh, he did have a, some, some very interesting, he, he recognized, Orson Hyde recognized that uh, it was a bad idea to get into side taking here in the politics of this valley with, with, with John Reese, who had commissioned a mill in Genoa. Couldn't pay for it because he'd gone bankrupt. So Elsie Knott, Thomas Knott, who built the mill, had left his son in the mill with a gun. <laughs> no, literally, living in the mill with a gun. And John Reese is saying, it's my mill. And, and now um, uh, Brigham Young sends Orson Hyde in, and he says, you're going to help the Reese Company. And, and Orson Hyde, who's a, a responsible person, looks at this and says, this is nuts. You know, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be a judge and take this mill away from, you know, and, well, he did. He finally, he finally, he felt he had that out, he, he railed against it, he talked about it, he said, you know, this place is full of people that swear and all this. And finally, he, he did it. He held a trial. And he, 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 re, he refused to look at the, the, he ruled out the evidence. <laughs> he, 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 he ruled out the evidence showing that that um, the, the, the lien paper, and after he ruled in, in John Reese's favor, favor uh, federal judge Drummond roared into town and reversed the decision, like right away. <laughs> and, and, and Orson Hyde was done. You know, he said, "I'm done," and he he, took, he moved his operations up to Washoe Valley, built his own mill. That's that's the mill in Washoe Valley that he built. He, not, not getting this mill. Not my own mill. He could see the potential for a mill. 
Uh, the cost of uh, a mill could do flour and a mill could do lumber. Uh, flour was very expensive and, and there was a market here. You had starving emigrants coming into this valley. If you could make flour, you had a lot of people you could feed. And if you could mill lumber, it was obvious that this was a place where you could build. You could, not, not gonna, Ragtown was built with wagon beds. In fact, there's a great picture of the story out here of the Mott, uh, the Mott School, I think, school, built from wagon beds. Wagon beds, uh, taken many of them from the 40 mile desert. They, they used to go out to the 40 mile desert and, and haul in hundreds of wagon beds. Uh, they built the mill with iron melted from the wagon beds and lumber. So anyway, these stories go on and on and on and on. No, there must be some questions. Let's go back to the, go ahead. Well, we can't lucky Bill's assets when he was disposed of. Oh boy, there's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> the whole area is um, kind of, uh, he, he's, he's lynched in 1858, and the real, um, there, there, there are sort of coherent records through the 1850s, and then about 1860, 1861, the records here seem to sort of evaporate and, and not exist. There's, cha there's really, real chaos going on here. Nobody's crying about it much because people are setting up to make lots of money. You know, then there's, then there's 10 years of lawsuits after that, and there's lots of records. But what happens is that, um, in general, property holdings pro in, in that first period are often not recognized. If you weren't sitting there holding your property, it's not yours anymore after that, 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 that juncture. So Orson Hyde, when he comes back in 62, says, I own the mill. And they say, uh, we don't want to go there. That's legally too complex for us. And he calls down a curse. And Slide Mountain, and sure enough, Falls down right <laughs> But uh, Lucky Bill, sort of the same kind of thing happens a little earlier. When he's gone, you now have, um, you know, people just take his, take his lands, take his property. There isn't, you know, there's some records of what he owned, but it's not, land transfers are not real clear all through this period. When the colonists, when he owns Eagle Valley, at one point, and then we know he, he owns it because Reese turns it over to him. So he owns it, but there's no record of him selling it to anybody. And then we see other people like, you know, Mankin then, then has it. Um, probably what happened to, to Eagle Valley is that the Eagle Valley station in 51 was, was, um, was set up by a man named Bernard, who was the postmaster down here, uh, was in, in partnership with Reese on the cattle and was sent up there, him and Hall, and Hall and Bernard, it may have been Bernard's brother or something, because it's another Bernard, but they went up there where Eagle Station is, which is at the corner of Fifth Street and Thompson Street. That spot was chosen because of the hay. It wasn't a trading station on the Immigrant Trail. It was chosen because of the hay that occurred when King's Canyon flowed out into, and kind of spread out across the valley, that creek, uh, which is now King Street, and it still is a creek sometimes. If you um, that's all, that was all hay, natural hay. So they put the station right there for the hay. And what appears to have happened within a couple of years, they probably overgrazed it. And it seems to have become kind of worthless. And otherwise, somebody would have tracked that Latin land record. That's just my guess is that they, they, there was no irrigation. They just were relying on that natural. Good question. All kinds of details. I love the details. <laughs> what happened to his wives? His wives. Oh, there's a good, good question. His younger wife. Um, Was that the city or the country wife? That's the country wife, the ranch wife, the young one. The older one he kept in town. The younger one was at the ranch. Uh, well, you know, some men, when they take a you know new wife, they, they discard their old one. Well, he was more considerate than that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I mean, just a perspective. I mean, that's the kind of thing, Bill, Lucky, I, when I do Lucky Bill, that's one of the things I always point out, because that's the way Lucky Bill would have looked at it, um, or at least tried to get everyone else to look at it. Um, his younger wife married one of the border ruffian horse thieves, and seems to have moved to Lone Pine and down in that area. Um, his older wife uh, went crazy and was put in the same style. And I can see why. <laughs> his son became a famous gambler, uh, in his own right, somewhat gambler, 
in Carson City. And, um, and, and there are no photographs of him. There are no real tracings of you know, anything that ever happened in his wake, except for one thing. And that is that in 1880, the newspapers reported <coughs> that um, he, in fact, uh, well, he had been hanging by a rope in, in, uh, in North End Valley here. And Dr. King, from King's Resort in King's Canyon, had come up and admired his splendid physique. This was, and he said, what a fine specimen for scientific investigation. Can I have the body? Well, well most physicians in prior to 1875 in this country were homeopathic. Uh, Dr. King ran a resort. This means he's taking advantage of the waters and the herbs and you know, cooking with medicinal plants and probably studying with the Washoe Indians. There's a lot of that going on in Carson City. And uh, so he takes his body, puts him on the buckboard, takes him up to his resort, you know, puts the various herbs and elixirs on him, and of course hooks him up to a galvanic battery, mm. which was a standard cure at the time. Yes. Uh, Alf Doten refers to sitting in the bathtub with the you know, wires in the, in, in, in the water. You know. This is the 19th century. <laughs> Don't try this at home, children. <laughs> and, 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 um, See now, storing him fries, <laughs> um, and and so he throws the switch, and Lucky Bill stands again, and he starts to you know rig thimbles, and and he and he comes back to life. <laughs> it's in the paper. Come on. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I think somebody said he's selling real estate now in Colorado. <laughs> but. That tells you that there's a whole lore of Lucky Bill, and it actually goes back to the 1855 article. Um, interviews are done with people here in the valley for decades after his lynching, in which people who were children at the time that he was lynched remember him. And, and in 1913, I mean, there's still people who are doing these accounts and saying, oh, and, and they're quoting the article, by the way. They're quoting the article Lucky Bill commissioned, so he was a great press agent for himself. But, you know, what a great storyteller. You know, we love sitting in the bar and the saloon listening to his stories, and he was a great guy, and everybody loved him. Um, that seems to be what everybody's re re recollection is, even though that's what he also said about himself. And, um, and it, so that is presumably is true. And, that, and it helps explain a little bit about why he was lynched. Because um, Ormsby, Ormsby is a funny guy in terms of personality. He's, he's, he's kind of a backroom puppeteer. Never, he, he's like always wants to be in control, but he's, it's always somebody else that's in charge. You know, somebody else running the meeting, somebody else getting elected to the office. Some, but Ormsby's always back there. Always, Ormsby's always there. You know, the, the citizen with his bell. You know, that's that's Ormsby, and, and, and just, just I'm just an ordinary teamster kind of a guy. You know, trying to make the world a better place, and. Uh, curiously enough, almost immediately um, from the point, from the time that Armsby is um, killed, people in this area want nothing to do with him. Almost immediately. Uh, there's, a, there's a funeral for him, he's buried at the foot of Sea Hill, and he's forgotten by everybody before that even happens. There's a few people who say, oh, he was a great guy. I think Roop is the only guy that says that. Roop says he was a great guy. But nobody talks about him. He's, he's, Occasionally, Margaret Trump, you know, Ormsby, the, you know, the, the widow of the great of the great William Ormsby, but Ormsby was too much, too forward, too too much in one direction, and and people had real misgivings about, uh, you know, what he did with the Paiutes and and cast it in a very negative light. Of course, he, he, you know, as I gave, he he would have given you a very complex explanation for why he needed to charge in.